present itself beautifully with that very streamlined body to work as a submarine. Soon the crew realizes they need a second car and Peter Lamont handles the task of finding it. I was dealing with a gentleman called Don McLaughlin and uh, so he said, uh, we, but we don't have a second one. You know, we only make, you know, so many a week. So I said, well, the chairman's got one. He said, but it's the chairman. So I said, well, ask him. So, of course, Colin Chapman was absolutely delighted that we, we wanted his car. We did the famous scene where the uh, Lotus comes out of the water. Of course, cars don't do that. Lotuses don't. Where you see it coming up out of the water onto the beach, it was on a big cable which we pulled out. The scene launches a Bond film tradition. For the next two movies, Moonraker... And for your eyes only, this mysterious character reappears. That was a ghastly in-joke of uh, Lewis Gilbert and myself. The man is called Victor Turjansky. He was one of the best uh, uh, local assistant directors. I have done a few parts here and there, like helping out, you know, at the last moment when, a, when an actor was not on time or something. And they asked me to do it, so I said, well, I'll, let's try, can I do, can I use a bottle? So I take like a double take, I was looking first at the Lotus, then at the bottle. He said, do anything you want to do, and let's, let's see what happens. But he was, he was happy. Filmmakers have gotten the Lotus out of the water, but getting it into the water proves to be a difficult challenge. Can you swim? All that was done as a model in the, in the Bahamas. I said I needed, I think it was seven cars, seven shells. When it first went into the sea, that was shot with one of the dummy cars, had a big tube, you know, it was like um, fired on air. And the first shot you see underwater was a miniature. When the wheels go up inside, that had to be one car. Then the, the arch filled in with a, like a fairing that filled in, that had to be another car. And then the fins came out, that was another car. Everything's designed to operate for the 30 seconds or minute or however long the camera is running, uh, just purely for that purpose. Uh, it doesn't work before and it doesn't work afterwards. We had one car that was sent to Perry Submarines in Miami and they motorized it. Old Man Perry was a real character. One of those fellows who was a designer engineer and always trying to do new things. So he thought that was a great challenge and he would you know, he did it. He turned one of these Lotus cars into a submarine. It hasn't any air in it. It's just guys in wetsuits, and they, they breathe through breathing apparatus, so there's water inside the submarine. The unit in the Bahamas also shoots the mammoth model of Stromberg's lair, Atlantis. The model submarines and the biggest miniature of them all, the Liparis supertanker. Because it had to swallow the submarines, I worked out a size for the submarines and then scaled the supertanker to the submarines. He came up with a model of tanker that was about 65 feet long. And we had a 48 horsepower even rude engine, which we didn't put outboard, we put it inboard. And that gave us the, the wash that we needed, because I'd looked at all these shots of super tanker, and you know, you get something like a, I think it's a three mile wash behind it. When the film was shown, we invited the people from Shell to come and see it. We invited the captain of the vessel to the premiere. They said, well, how did you get a real tanker? And we said, no, we didn't get a real tanker, that's a model. The captain of that vessel didn't realise that there was not a single shot of his ship in the movie. It was all modelled. They just couldn't believe it, because it was so realistic. And that's probably one of the greatest compliments about a model unit you'll ever get. When one is in Egypt, one should delve deeply into its treasures. On the other side of the Atlantic, the first unit travels to Egypt. We were only about 10 days or maybe two weeks before we were due to actually arrive to film. And we got a message from the government saying that they were taking over both hotels, lock, stock and barrel, during the period that we were going to be shooting. It took two days to get a telephone call through to England. We had difficulty, in fact, uh, getting our film in and out, uh, as there were no faxes, telephones or anything else that worked. And the worst times were when we shot yeah, by the pyramids. We went to the uh, pyramids to see the Sonny Lumiere, whether it could be lit or not. It was impossible. You could light the Sphinx, but, but lighting the pyramids and that, that 
distance, you couldn't do it. I also got over from Hollywood a brilliant uh, visual effects artist. Alan Mary was asked to come in and head up a team, and Alan asked me if I'd like to work with him on the optical unit. He'd won an Oscar for bed knobs and broomsticks, and he was Peter Lamont's cousin. My cousin, who collaborated with us on the, stop, on the picture, he, he made the little models. There were no pyramids, they never shot. All the pyramids were models, and, uh, and all the audience and, were models. There was one shot they needed, which the first unit hadn't shot, was Roger standing and looking at the pyramids, and they never shot it and they never shot a, a plate or anything. And, and Alan said, well, let's go to the publicity department and find out what stills there are of Roger, if there's any sort of profile shots of Roger. So we found this still of Roger looking. And Alan made a large, uh, large print of it. And uh, we actually did the cutaway of Roger washing the pyramids with a still frame, and nobody ever noticed it. There were some problems the crew faced in Egypt that even a top visual effects unit could not solve. The food was very depressing. The food was pretty diabolical, there's no question about that. I had a deputation from the crew saying, look, Bill, do you think we could just shoot right through this location and not bother with a day off? Cubby then, who was a good general, said, we'll bring all the food from England in one big air-conditioned truck, refrigerated truck. It was all being shipped in and we had visions of this great uh, kitchen coming in with his, his chef. They opened the door to the truck hoping to see all these wonderful legs of lamb etc. Nothing. There was nothing in the truck at all. Just empty. For Cubby Broccoli this is a key moment. This is his film and his film alone. I can see a lot of very uh, upset technicians and workmen on them and I very quickly had to think what I could do. You know it's the ultimate responsibility of the, of the producer to feed and water the crew. Being a sort of a cook around the house and I do a lot of amateur cooking I decided I would cook up a big spaghetti do for the boys because I knew they all liked that sort of thing. So Cubby got in a jeep with uh, one of the crew and they went searching for pots and pans and pasta and tomatoes. I had to fly in, had to fly someone into Cairo to get the spaghetti. Cubby got in the catering wagon with his other caterers there and he cooked all the sp mountains and mountains of spaghetti. This is the producer with an apron on and he's cooking for the whole unit. And they were so delighted, they all applauded at the end of it. If you go to Ramesseum now, in the restaurant there, which we took over, there's a sign on the wall which says Trattoria Broccoli. After that, Cubby could do no wrong. Cubby was uh, so loved by the crews on occasion, because he really cared, cared about everybody. I don't know any other producer in the, in the world who would have gone to that trouble. To show his appreciation for their hard work in Egypt, Cubby announces a paid holiday for the crew upon their return to London. Of course, the most challenging aspect of the film still had to be shot. At the time, there was no stage which would have served both as a tank and uh, uh, big enough to house three uh, nuclear-powered submarines. We tried finding locations where we could find a huge hangar or something. We looked all over the place for a place to do it. That's where my decision has to come in, and that's where my decision did come in. We'll have to build the stage in the studio. I decided not to make the same error, maybe, that I did on Yoni Lift twice when I designed the volcano crater on the back lot of Pinewood. We couldn't leave it standing because from the outside it was an eyesore. So this time I designed the stage around the set. Now what will lead you into the set and which will is, is, is going to be the submarine because remember that's going to be pretty big in foreground. Ken Adams plan was to build the set inside as the outside went up. I was instructed to document the growth of this extraordinary stage and I would go up every day or once a week, depending on 
what kind of dramatic stuff was happening, and I would photograph it. We were completing the set as they started to put the cover on and do the sides. I think our major concern uh, as filmmakers was, was it going to get up? From the time we started to build the cover, 13 weeks later, we shot the set. The design challenge was really to give that hold of the super tank cars an interesting look. It was, again, you know, a huge collaboration by all the trades to get it done, and the finishers, and they were extraordinary. So they built this huge, which became known as the 007 stage. One of the chaps that was most interested in seeing how things were progressing was Claude Renoir, the cameraman. All that friend, uh, this one, then turn a little more. Turn it right. Yeah, I guess. Claude Renoir was one of the nicest and most capable uh, directors of photography. Claude, of course, was the grandson of uh, Renoir the painter. He was one of the great cameramen of the world. I mean, Bardo wouldn't do a picture without, without him. What I didn't know is that Claude was having some trouble with his eyesight. I felt he was very nervous to be catapulted into a gigantic set like the interior of the super tanker because he'd never had to deal with that sort. I take him down there and show him this great enormous set and he looks at this thing and I said to Claude, well, tell us what you're going to need here to light this thing. And he said, well, tell you the truth, Bill, I actually can't see the end of the set, so really it doesn't matter what I need because I can't see to the end of it. Since the dimensions were enormous, I wanted to get another opinion in on how to use my practicals and whether to improve on them and so on. For that second opinion, Ken Adam turns to legendary filmmaker Stanley Kubrick. He said, I must be mad. You know, nobody must know. Stanley would have done it in an extremely low-key, I'm not here kind of a way. I will guarantee that nobody will ever know that you came. And I talked him into it. He did do that and um, helped enormously. Stanley came and spent three or four hours with me on that set. It was a very difficult set to light, not only because of the, the vastness, but because of all the shiny surfaces. I remember he said to Ken, why don't you use floodlights as part of the set lighting? So in effect, you're lighting the set. The set is a triumph, securing Ken Adam and his team an Academy Award nomination. The 007 stage is launched on December the 5th, 1976, with all the fanfare of an aircraft carrier. Former Prime Minister Sir Harold Wilson performs the ceremony. I felt a certain amount of pride when all these dignitaries arrived. It was quite exciting, really. When you actually walk in the set and it's all dressed to film, it is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. It was a wonderful set, and it looked terrific on the screen. It was bigger inside than it was outside, if you know what I mean. You stood at the end of it, and it was like, Wow! The Spy Who Loved Me premieres July the 7th, 1977. 7777 proves to be a very lucky date for James Bond and for the sole producer of the James Bond films, Albert R. Cubby Broccoli. The success of Spy was important. It was Cubby's first film as the sole producer of the Bond movies. We all knew it was going to be one of the greatest films. The film's worldwide success proves once and for all that nobody does it better. Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night.